Hi there, I am Dr. Stewart, and today we're going to talk about um, a specific genus of bacteria. We're going to talk about Staphylococcus, and um, I picked this kind of bacteria um, to focus on because it's one that is really common uh, on humans and other uh, mammals, and also it's a bacteria that can cause some major problems uh, with the skin. So um, first off, Staphylococcus is a genus of bacteria. So um, it's a genus that contains about 40 different species of different um, bacteria. Now, a couple of these species are f commonly found in humans. That's going to be Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, um, including a couple others that aren't quite as common, like Staph lugdunensis, which we'll cover um, this week in a, in a paper this week or next week. But the rest of the 40 or so species are going to be found mostly in other mammals. Uh, like some of them are found in goats, some of them are only found in dolphins. So um, it really is specific to, to the host of, of mammals. So with Staphylococcus, we're looking at like 40 different species. Um, a few are most common in humans. Um, perfect. Humans. Now, another thing about um, Staphylococcus, every bacteria or bacteria that exists in this genus is the fact that they're going to be spherical in shape, right? That's the coccus form of the, of the name. And they are going to be arranged in clusters. So they're going to be sphere, um, sphere shaped, um, and they're going to be arranged in clusters. Now the reason that um, they're arranged in these clusters is because when these guys divide, um, they're actually going to divide in all different directions. So you're going to start off with one bacterium, which duplicates into two and then four, and they just kind of form these clumps. And they look like grapes. The reason you'll kind of see them most often um, in this purple color is because they are gram positive bacteria. And what that means is that they're going to have a thick cell wall of um, peptidoglycan. Of peptidoglycan. Okay. And really, that is that really thick cell wall of all those polysaccharides are going to pick up, or all those um, thick uh, cell wall is going to pick up that crystal violet stain during the gram uh, during the gram stain. So they really look like bunches of, of purple grapes. All right. Now, another thing about every uh, species of staph is that these guys are going to be facultative anaerobes. And what that means is that they can um, uh, live in both oxygen or in the absence of oxygen. So they can undergo um, cellular respiration using oxygen, so oxidative metabolism, or they can undergo uh, fermentation. So these are facultative anaerobes. Perfect. All right. And another thing that I kind of wanted to um, talk about, some general characteristics of staff, is that all of these guys are typically really tough, and they stay alive even in the presence of some pretty harsh conditions. So um, they are resistant to salty environments. So like our skin is a really salty place, and um, that poses no problems whatsoever to um, certain species of staff. They also are resistant to ultraviolet light, so when they're exposed to, to sunlight, it typically does not kill them, um, which is, you know, quite, quite rare for, for bacteria. In addition, they can withstand high temperatures, and so um, they can survive in some pretty harsh conditions, which explains why they are so good at hanging out on our skin and living there. Okay. Another thing that they do is that they... Um, create uh, what's called a, uh, a slime layer, mm. right? And this slime layer is made up of um, some polysaccharides in the form of this slime that coats the bacteria. And what that does is that it allows them to kind of hide from our own immune cells so that these bacteria can live on our bodies and, and even in our tissues, but they're hiding inside this slime layer that they've produced which uh, prevents the white blood cells of our own immune system from, from killing those guys. So mm -hmm. the slime layer allows um, the bacteria to hide from um, white blood cells. Good. All right.
Now, um, those are some general characteristics of staph uh, bacteria, but I'm going to focus on probably the two most common species of staph that you'll find on the human body. The first is a pathogenic strain, often a pathogenic strain, and this is Staphylococcus aureus or Staph aureus. Now, Staph aureus is tough because, well, first off, it's commonly found in, in humans. In fact, about 25% of the population um, is going to have Staph aureus living on their bodies at some point in their life. And Staph aureus is typically going to live in the nose, so it kind of colonizes the nasal cavities. But if it's able to spread to other parts of the body, it can cause um, some, some problems. Now, a couple of um, kind of characteristics of Staph aureus is the fact that um, it contains enzymes that help it cause harm to the body, right? So Staph aureus has these harmful, well, let me, let me say, uh, like, well, let me back up a little bit. So what did I say? 25% of people colonized by Staph aureus. So about 25% of the people are colonized. It lives in the nose. And what makes it bad for us is it contains some nasty enzymes. And these enzymes allow the Staph aureus to do some um, harm to our, our body. Some of the enzymes that I'm talking about here, let's see, what are some of the enzymes that we've talked about? So one of those is coagulase. So Staph aureus is coagulase positive. Coagulase positive. And that is something that differentiates it from Staph epidermidis because Staph epidermidis is coagulase negative. Well, co coagulase is an enzyme that allows the bacteria to cause our blood to clot. This is important because it can cause these little minor blood clots in our tissues and allows the Staph aureus to hide from our own immune cells in addition to the slime layer. Okay. Another enzyme that it has is called um, staphylokinase. And this staphylokinase is an enzyme that allows it to dissolve blood clots. One thing that's, that's common about Staph aureus is that it's hemolytic. And that's a term that says that it will destroy and basically eat our own red blood cells, which is, which is a major problem. Okay. Another thing that Staph aureus contains are enzymes called uh, lipase. And uh, lipase is an enzyme that allows it to break down lipids. And it uses this for fuel. So what it'll do is staph will break down the lipids in um, our own sebum. Now, sebum is a, a lipid-rich substance that our hair follicles secrete to keep our skin nice and oily. Well, staph aureus uses lipase to eat that sebum as, as fuel. And that's why it loves to, to live in our bodies. Okay. Another thing that Staph aureus contains is not in addition to these uh, enzymes that can be kind of nasty is that it um, has some really nasty toxins. Um, a couple of the toxins that it contains are um, toxins that will kill our white blood cells directly. So it'll secrete these chemicals that kill white blood cells. And it secretes some toxins that will cause little holes to form in the blood vessels within our skin so that the Staph aureus can go into our vessels and travel to different areas. So it's just a really nasty bacteria that can cause some problems due to these enzymes and these toxins. Now, um, oftentimes what will happen is if you have like a little cut or um, even like a pimple that becomes infected with Staph aureus, it will, these Staph aureus uh, bacteria will start to replicate and that will lead to um, a condition called folliculitis often. So folliculitis is inflammation of the hair follicles due to Staph aureus infections. If it becomes pretty... Uh, extreme, then the little pimple that's associated with folliculitis might develop into a uh, furuncle or a boil, and that's just a larger infection that has penetrated into the deep tissues of the skin, even into the hypodermis. Okay. Um, the, the body does a really good job of trying to isolate that infection. So if you have like one of those furuncles, um, the, the body will kind of isolate the infected tissue with um, some really tough uh, proteins called fibrin, and that's why that type of infection is going to be hard to the touch. Right? Um, 
Now, if Staph aureus is able to invade the bloodstream, you're gonna call it can lead to widespread infection of the blood called bacteremia. And if it is allowed to kind of penetrate the heart, it could cause inflammation of the pericardium around the heart called pericarditis. And this is uh, an extremely big uh, problem, right? It could be an extremely large issue. Other issues that Staph aureus can cause is uh, pneumonia and even food poisoning. Now, in contrast, staph, staph epidermidis is not nearly as harmful. In fact, 90% of the bacteria on every human um, is staph epidermidis, right? So it's a part of our normal kind of bacterial flora. 90% of bacteria on humans, okay? And... What else can we say about staph epidermidis? It lacks coagulase, so it's, this is coagulase negative. So it is unable to um, form blood clots. It also lacks these harmful enzymes and these toxins. So it's not nearly as harmful as a bacteria. Okay? Um, it's just a naturally occurring bacteria that lives on our bodies. However, it does contain lipase um, and it uses that to eat the sebum on our um, body tissues. Now, one thing that, um, oh, and then one other thing is that um, both Staph epidermidis and Staph aureus are both catalase positive. Catalase is an enzyme that reacts with hydrogen peroxide, and it breaks hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. And so that's why if uh, you put hydrogen peroxide on these Staph bacteria, it will react with the catalase, and that creates a very violent chemical reaction, which kills the bacteria. That's why it bubbles up when you dump um, um, catalase on the, the staph. And in fact, the catalase test is a really nice way to differentiate um, a staphylococcus bacteria, both either staph aureus or staph epidermidis, from other bacteria that lack catalase, like um, pneumonia, I believe, or streptococcus, right, is, is a good way to differentiate it. All right. Now, one thing, if we go back over to staph epidermidis, one thing that's really interesting about it is that although it doesn't contain these nasty enzymes or um, toxins, it still can cause infections, especially in immune-compromised persons. And um, it does this typically through uh, by forming a biofilm around something like a catheter or an instrument that's been inserted into the body. Now, a biofilm is a thick layer of bacteria that is... Um, kind of hard for the body to fight because it's such a thick layer. You know, it can't get into that film of, of bacteria. And if that's the case, so if you have this biofilm around a catheter or whatever it may be, and you're dealing with an immune-compromised person, staph epidermidis can cause some really nasty infections, which can also lead to things like um, bacteremia and pericarditis. Now, what's scary about staph epidermidis is if it does cause an infection in these rare cases, it is extremely <laughs> resistant to antibiotics. Resistant... To antibiotics. Extremely difficult to treat this guy. In fact, about 70%, 75% of all strains of staph epidermidis are resistant to methicillin antibiotics. So these are methicillin resistant staphylococcus epidermidis. That's a big deal. So that means that a high power to antibiotics, such as vancomycin, is going to be needed to treat such an infection of staph epidermidis. So um, it's really best to avoid that infection altogether. And the best way to do that is to make sure that any type of surgical instrument is completely clean, especially when dealing with some folks that are immune compromised. Um, what else can we say about staph epidermidis? Now, um, staph aureus is more susceptible to antibiotics but um, more strains of staph epidermidis are kind of emerging that are resistant to even some of the more high-powered antibiotics. You might have heard of MRSA. Well, this is methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus, and um, it's going to be resistant to methicillin antibiotics like penicillin, and it's going to typically require a more high-powered um, and expensive and um, kind of uh, dangerous antibiotic like vancomycin, which has to be administered through, um, what's it called, a uh, IV, right? And so this can be very difficult to treat. Now, the reason that antibiotic resistance has become such a problem is because uh, due to the high reproduction rates of these bacteria, um, you know, they can 
uh, divide very quickly within the fact of like 20 to 30 minutes is that uh, evolution is going to, mutations that arise randomly are going to allow for the evolution of resistance to different antibiotics, and that's a major problem, okay? And that's one reason why we're kind of constantly searching new um, ways to treat um, these and if these bacteria so that they don't cause these really nasty infections like bacteremia which are untreated because the, the, the bacteria is now resistant to, to antibiotics so, all right that's about it that's a cool overview of, of staff make sure make sure I kind of went over everything yep that'll do it okay thank you